We are talking to Connor O'Neill, the Wake Forest Rivals publisher, the man who knows everything about the Demon Deacons. Uh, big game, kind of a weird game, the way this is set up, because, you know, NC State's emotions have been all over the map the last few weeks in light of the quarterback situation. But they're they're kind of entering the contest with, with some momentum, with a little upswing, some good mojo. And then there's Wake, who everybody has been bullish on all season long until the third quarter against Louisville. So what 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 you know, what kind of version? Do you think that was just an aberration for Wake in the third quarter or or were some things discovered? Yeah, that, I think that nightmare is not repeatable. Uh I just I have a hard time believing that Wake is going to be that insecure with the football. Um, obviously, it's on Sam. He's the one that fumbled three times and threw three interceptions. But uh, the pressure that Louisville generated, uh, you know, I think Wake knows that they have to come up with a with a solution to that, uh, or they're just going to keep seeing the same thing and. Uh, when your quarterback is pressured as much as Louisville pressured Sam, it's not a recipe for success, no matter how many weapons you have on the outside and how many good running backs you have and that kind of thing. So I think it's part aberration. I think there were some things that Louisville did that, you know, NC State has some of the same kind of twitchy and uh, really fast, versatile athletes that they can get matched up one on one with the tackle. and get pressure on the edge. So uh, I I think some of it is repeatable, but not, you know, the results probably aren't repeatable. Like I, I don't know when the last time, a, if it's ever happened, a team has had six turnovers in one quarter in NCAA football. Like that's just, it's incredible. Like the pick six as time expired in the quarter was just such the, the cherry on top of just a complete, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how censored you want me to be here, but just, just that kind of Sunday, uh, that was the cherry on top of it. I was thinking, like, obviously, you probably suffered through Miami and Duke, and they had, <laughs> and Miami had eight turnovers, but I don't know how many they had in a particular quarter. Yeah, I, I don't think it was ever more than three or four in one quarter. I only listened to that game. I tried to. I was uh, covering Wake BC, or ironically, Duke's opponent. Uh, this this Friday, um, for whatever reason, I couldn't pull up the stream when I had been able to pull up the stream like two weeks before when Duke was playing Georgia Tech on the regional sports networks. But I just had to pull up uh, David Shoemate and the guys at Duke do a great job with their broadcast. So I listened to it and, and was uh, – flashing hand signals to people in the wake press box that knew I was listening to the game of like five turnovers, six mm. turnovers, seven turnovers, eight turnovers. Just it's wild to think. I think, you know, the, the last time a team had eight turnovers in a game was 2009, Nebraska, I believe. Wow. And now it's happened in back-to-back -back weeks, both ACC teams. Now the one of the things I was thinking about, you know, it, one of the weird dynamics about Wake is that people associate their best effort with a loss, and now this past weekend is their worst effort with a loss. You know, in a lot of ways, they gained a lot of mileage in the Clemson game in terms of perspective and um, ultimate moral victory. You know, every cliche you want to throw at the book. You know, how much have how much have you kind of sensed that? that Clemson game showed how good Wake Forest could be. And do you think that offense that torched the Clemson secondary, are we going to see that again? Is it is it doable? One of the reasons they torched Clemson secondary is because Clemson secondary was down three of their top five players. Uh, one of the other reasons was because Clemson, for the first three quarters of that game, insisted on keeping those one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside and Wake's receivers are good enough to beat, you know, I think it was Toriano pride jr. Was one of them. Sheridan Jones was another one. Uh, Nate Wiggins was, was another name who was out there. I mean, you know, Wake's receiver, like AT Perry's a fifth year guy. Uh, I know a lot of 
people watching this on the Wolfpack side of things think that he is very physical and over the line to some points. And I would agree with that. Like he, he does get away with some stuff. Um, but he's a fifth year guy. Donovan green is a fourth year guy who was a star before an ACL cost him last season. And he's fit right back into the mold. And then the new guy is, is still a third year guy. Like Jamal banks is the revelation of the position. And, He's a 21 year old who played at St. Francis Academy in Baltimore. Like he's a, he's a refined established star. Um, It's not like they just brought him in as a true freshman and he's having this kind of impact. He's been in the system. He's, he's grown in it. Um, And now they just kind of reveal him and unveil him. I think he, he's either leading or close to the lead in reception touchdowns in the ACC right now. So it's Wake's offense is such is so dedicated to the principle of take what the defense gives you. And for those first three quarters, Clemson was just saying, okay, we, we think we can sack you before you can throw these bombs to your, to your guys on the outside. And they weren't able to do it. Like they got to Sam a couple times, but they weren't able to do it. Um, Louisville got to him before they look the, that, Louisville got to him before they could throw those passes. Um, they're just, they're back there so fast. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really have much of a problem saying that I think Louisville's defensive front is probably twitchier and faster than Clemson's defensive front. I mean, it was just, it was that impressive of a defensive uh, line and, and the couple linebackers, uh, Yusir Abdullah. What you was, what'd you say? You know what's crazy about that? What? Boston College, which just lost to UConn, scored 34 points against Louisville. I know. If that doesn't sum up the ACC, I don't know what does. I think it just speaks to Louisville and and the coaching situation that's going on in there. Like, they were fired up. They were were all kinds of geared up to play a top-10 team at home. Nobody gets geared up. Nobody gets fired up to go to Boston College to play a, I don't know, I think that was a noon game. Like, nobody gets fired up to play at Boston College at noon. It's kind of, you know, until the last two years, it's kind of like Wake. Like, Wake, you knew that, uh, you know, some, some road places you go into and you get teams that are a little more fired up. Like, I, I see it um, – on the other half of the beat that I have with Duke basketball, like teams go into Cameron now and they know they have to give Duke their best. Like they, they play into the environment. There's a, there's a thought process there that Cameron works against Duke in a couple ways that, you know, you, you wouldn't think because teams just come in there really fired up to play. That doesn't happen when teams go to BC or when teams go to Wake before before the last couple of years when Wake has that number attached to their name. Another similarity I kind of see between Wake and NC State in, in roundabout ways. So you you saw a Wake Forest team that tried to find themselves without Sam Hartman at the beginning of the year. And now NC State has been trying to find themselves without Devin Leary toward the end of the year. You know, what do you kind of remember about you know, the meshing, and we're not talking about the other kind of meshing, <laughs> the meshing of Wake Forest, you know, what they normally do with the backup quarterback in the game and trying to figure out what he does best. And obviously NC State hopes that the last quarter and a half has unlocked what maybe MJ Morris does best as a true freshman. And I know Griffiths is not a true freshman, but there is some similarities in terms of lack of experience. Yeah, I, I mean, there's just such a difference with finding out on August 10th that you're going to be without your starting quarterback for an indefinite future at that point. Sure. Then there is the found out in one week that Devin Leary was done for the year. Yeah, yeah, um, and like it, it kind of Sam in those first week or week and a half of practices he was taking all the first team reps but there was an understanding there that Mitch was the next guy in line like there there was a competition they said there was a competition between him and Michael Kern but in my mind at least that competition was settled around the middle to late spring practices that we get to see 
it just became kind of apparent that Mitch was going to be the guy. So when when he's already been groomed to that over the summer and in the start of fall camp, makes it a lot easier of a of a transition. Um, I will say, like it 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 affected a couple receivers differently. Um, like at I I watching the rest of fall camp with Mitch Griffiths as the number one quarterback, like A.T. Perry looked to me like he was not the same type of receiver as he is with Sam Hartman throwing him the ball. And we saw more big plays made by Donovan Green, um, Jamal Banks, who came in with Mitch early in 2020. Uh, those types of guys made more plays than A.T. And then Sam comes back and A.T. I think had 142 yards and a touchdown against Vanderbilt. So the the chemistry there with the receivers was really interesting to watch uh one quarterback to the other back to back to sam yeah. a lot of people talk about the wake forest defense a lot of people still rag on it because of what happened last year against army and, and different things but you know the the whole theory the last few weeks with nc state was can they score 30 points? Because Wake probably will. And the question is, you know, there's this spark that happened from the Virginia Tech game. You know, prior to that game, it was a struggle to get to 20 points, you know, let alone 30. You know, but do you see this as a high-scoring game? Do you think Wake Forest's defense has reached the point where you have to earn – what you get against them because, you know, state had a few big plays, but I mean, they're not, you know, they're not ripping off 60 yarders. Everything because of how bad wakes third quarter was last week, everything else just kind of pales in comparison and, and just kind of gets thrown to the, uh, to the back burner. One of the biggest things that happened last week was Kalen Carson got healthy and came back and he's Wake's best corner. Uh, it's not even really up for debate, I think. And him coming back makes their secondary whole. Uh, they were really piecing things together before their off week. And then even last week coming out of the off week, they started a nickel on the perimeter and the backup nickel was at the other perimeter because corner spot. And the other guys like, got in there but like Kalen Carson is, is the biggest key and getting him back last week was huge um He'd man Wake's the guy that Wake would want on Thayer Thomas as much as possible yeah and he he actually cross-trained with getting into the nickel uh in early fall camp and then you didn't see very much of that uh they've been really happy with Isaiah Wingfield in this in the nickel spot I think that's who they're going to start with, but I think Kalen Carson could be the guy if if Wingfield doesn't get it done against Thayer Thomas, then it'll be it'll be Kalen moving in. Um, it's just it it's I I I go into every weight game thinking that the score is going to be somewhere in the 30s. Like they just they don't seem to play games that are that wind up being 20 to 13 uh they're certainly so far removed from the first couple of years when Clawson's ACC wins had to be 6-3 in overtime against Virginia Tech and the everybody's favorite meme mm -hmm. and uh the three nothing game at BC like they're they're it's not going to happen by accident, but you just get the sense that they're eventually going to hit on some plays like they're just they're so experienced. They're so talented. They have like their coaching staff, their offensive staff should be the envy of everybody in the ACC. Every coach, every, every coach and coordinator have been there the entire time. Clawson has been there. So that's nine years minus the tight ends coach. And he's only, only in his sixth season at wake. It's just the continuity uh, leads to such advanced communications during games like they're able to pick things up they're able to you know get things firing when they're not working uh i realize all of that flies in the face of the third quarter last week but that again to go back to the beginning like that just, i think that just chalks up to one nightmare of a quarter and i i don't know how 
repeatable that is. And that that's the great conundrum of the game is that, you know, how much of that third quarter is Wake Forest? How much of the last 20 minutes of the Virginia Tech game is is what NC State will be? And, you know, in the Wolfpack's case, I mean, they're also playing Virginia Tech. So, yeah. so you know, nice defense, um, but definitely a team that found a way to shoot themselves in the foot. You know, 14 pounds. 10 false starts. 10 false starts, you know. And, and, you know, it's funny. The two big plays that Virginia Tech did were very Wake Forest-esque, where they threw it up to Caleb Smith. He beat, you know, did some ha- nice hand job, you know, like a hand movements to kind of get free of Cheyenne battle on one and then just straight up catching on the other. And those were their big plays, and they had one nice drive. And then it's amazing how right – as soon as the fourth quarter began, they went right back to being Virginia Tech's offense, where everything was a struggle. And obviously, you know, Wake, again, the expectation has always been Wake will score 30-plus. And it'll be quite a challenge if State can get to that. Um, you know, on the State side, Dave uh, Savian Jackson is going to be out at defensive end. He's done for the season. Uh, they think. They're hopeful. Demi Sumo Karnbele will be back at running back. And He's very good. So the, the running game has been, um, we'll just say, inconsistent uh, this season. Um, you know, otherwise, I think most of the team is healthy otherwise. But a um, li- little thin on the second string defensive line. They played five defensive linemen against uh, Virginia Tech, which is unusual by state standards. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a true freshman is now on the two deep at defense, as a backup defensive end. So that that would be interesting. Um, but otherwise that, you know, pretty much most of the main guys are back. Um, you know, how you mentioned the cornerback being a big, or the secondary guy being a big boost to the Wake Forest defense, you know, how's, how's the health of the Deacons? How's the health of, of Demon Deacons? Um, they, they coming in pretty much the same team that they were hoping to start the season with. Yeah, we're Nick Anderson, the you know, everybody's favorite story from two years ago from freshman walk on yeah, to yeah, three yeah, interceptions yeah, against yeah, Virginia yeah. Tech. <laughs> He's not played all at all this year. Uh he had a summer injury and like early in fall camp, Dave Clawson told us he was uh hopeful to be back in week two of fall camp and all this it's just a timeline that's kept getting pushed further and further back. Uh, at this point, he hasn't redshirted a year. Like, 2020 didn't count, and he played all last season. So, at this point, it looks like, you know, why why rush him back? Uh, the other the other factor is they're getting good safety play, and they go five deep at safety now. So, it's not like a position where you're going to you're gonna rush a guy back and say, okay, if he's 80%, he can still help us. Um. You know, the one, the, the issue, one of the issues in the third quarter, there were several. Mm -hmm. Uh, Late in the second quarter, Wake's left tackle went down, Javionte Nash. He's a seventh year guy. Um, He came back eventually in the third quarter when Spencer Clapp was getting beat and was the cause of at least one or two of those strip sacks against Sam and, uh, so that's a, that's a situation where it's like he was hurt in the game and he came back, but do you do you really know that he's back just because he came back in? Did he come back in just because his replacement was getting beat badly enough that they needed to put him back out there? Something could have swelled up in the last, you know, 48, 72 hours type deal. So that'll be one to keep an eye on. Um, otherwise, man, I, you know, they're they're healthy, which which is kind of weird to say about Wake. Like usually, there's a lot more injury statuses to track at this time of year. Uh, maybe I'm jinxing them into something terrible here in the month of November, but yeah, they're they're relatively healthy. Cool. Anything else that's obvious? I get. I mean, just you you hit it. Uh, I want to know. Like, is the page already turned to MJ Morris era? Like, is this the the dawning of a new age for NC State in the last month here? 
I think so. I mean, I definitely think so for the rest of this season. Um, you know, this video will come out before Devin Leary does a Zoom at 6.30 Tuesday night. Um, I would assume Devin has some news to share. Um, <laughs> or at least he'll get asked a lot of questions about his future <laughs> plans during this Zoom. But uh, SAFE doesn't usually do Zooms with injured players, you know, as like they are doing tomorrow. So that's why we, we're just assuming there'll be something newsworthy from it. Um, but say if Devin goes pro, I mean, this looks like, you know, the next it could be the next four years of MJ Morris. Um, because they have to probably, they'll bring in a transfer quarterback. Um, yeah. That just comes down to, because they just don't have the depth um, of numbers at quarterback. So then they'll they'll then it comes then it really just comes down to is what kind of transfer quarterback can they attract? Will there be somebody who will want to challenge an MJ Morris, or will there be people who just kind of go in understanding? Well, I might not beat them out, but you know, being the backup to NC State, still a pretty sweet gig. So that that will be offseason drama. But um, I don't think we'll see a lot of Jack Chambers unless there's an injury. Um, you know, apparently very popular with teammates, but. You know, the, the passing game just did not click. Um, you know, could there be some special packages where Chambers came in with the express purpose of using his legs? Possible, you know, especially short yard goal line. But um, it just, you know, I mean, it was a nine-day difference, at least for one game. You know, and the one thing I always caution with when it comes to quarterbacks who are just bursting onto the scene like MJ Morris, well, now Wake has filmed. You know, now we can see what adjustments could be made possibly. And it'll be fascinating to see over these next four games, you know, how do teams approach NC State now that they've seen MJ as each week goes by. So, you know, I, I'm not going to fully judge him. Um, dating myself, I still remember the feeling of walking out of watching NC State play East Carolina years and years and years ago when redshirt freshman Russell Wilson helped them win in overtime. And I knew he was the guy, you know, they, I think it was like the third or fourth game of the season. Um, Andre Brown, I think, scored in overtime to win the game. And but you just knew because okay? Russell had gotten de decapitated against South Carolina and went to the hospital in the opener. And then I think he missed the next week. And then he finally established himself against East Carolina. And then uh, in the weirdest twist, he then got hurt in that East Carolina situation. So he didn't, didn't play the next week, but it was clear that once he was healthy, that he was the guy and it has that same vibe with, with that. I'm not comparing MJ Morris to Russell Wilson, even though they both wear number 16, but it has that vibe of, okay, he's their guy, you know, that, that they're going to ride him. If, if they don't get somebody better in the transfer portal, this could be it for the next three and a half years. And how they let somebody get Russell Wilson's number? They decided years ago to honor Mario Williams and Russell Wilson, and the players have a patch. So they're not retired. So Savian Jackson got the number nine jersey. Yeah, I remember about the nine jersey when Bradley Chubb was wearing it. So, well, okay. The problem with the 16 jersey is that, and I'm sure there's somebody who will watch this who will be like, oh, there's been more than just one quarterback. Only other quarterback I remember wearing 16 is Manny Stocker. And up trying to <laughs> Pittsburgh. So maybe there's been others, you know, but there hasn't been a long line of, of quarterbacks wearing 16, at least not that I know of. So I'm sure there might've been another, but I do remember Manny Stalker. So MJ Morris got to wear number 16. And then because Bradley Chubb ended up blowing up, brother of a famous Wake Forest linebacker. I'm sure if Bradley's watching this, he'll appreciate being known as the brother of a Wake Forest linebacker. <laughs> um, you know, then number nine became Mario Williams and Bradley Chubb. And uh, and that's a special number. And then not not anything to do with a pass player, but then state decided number one would be one of those jerseys that would go to someone special. So then uh, this year was Isaiah Moore, the middle linebacker, who's had a gotcha. terrific season, terrific season. So it's those are kind of what they did. Probably because these schools are are they don't have enough jerseys to go around if they have to retire them, retire them. So it became honored. Plus, you know, states always had that dynamic where they retired David Thompson, but nobody else in basketball. So, you know, it, it, it kind of works for them as a 
culture of the school where they limit the number of retired jerseys in football. But um, you know, I, I I don't know. We'll see how the, how things change over time. But um, but yeah, that and I'm sure there was also like this was a nice way of a peace treaty with Russell. Yeah. You know, and I bet one day Russell will tweet out talking about how weird it is for him to see number 16 running around playing quarterback at NC State. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet, but I bet one day he'll he'll sit down, he'll watch a game when the Broncos aren't doing something, and he'll be like, dang, there's number there's a number 16 running around playing quarterback at State. But I, I get it. I mean, I was watching the Falcons-Panthers game, and there was a defensive back for the Falcons wearing number 21. Yeah. Well, on that particular play either. And I'm like, oh, man. Kind of weird seeing somebody in Dion's number. Wake has, I think, five retired jerseys in football. And I, I swear the only one that I know off the top of my head, uh, I guess I don't really know it if I'm not sure, but I think 33 was Brian Piccolo. Nobody wears 33. That would make sense. Uh, I don't know if they've had any like quarterback that they would retire it for. Honestly, if they wanted to make a case that they're going to retire. Yeah, Riley was number 13, I think, and they've got guys wearing 13 on both sides of the ball. Uh, but will Hartman end up rewriting the record book, even if he goes pro with a year left? Well, that's my thing is, like, if, if they wanted to retire 10 for quarterbacks, like you have you have Hartman and you have John Wolford. There's a pretty strong case that between the – the nine years of quarterbacking that you got out of those two. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a strong, that's a strong case to, to, for them to get your program to where it was with the, with the helper from Jamie Newman also, but basketball wise too, they've got, they've got a ton of retired jerseys in basketball. I mean, nobody's wearing Tim Duncan's number, Randolph Childress, uh, Chris Scott, Paul. I think. Chris Paul, yeah. Um, Muggsy yeah. might be retired too. Can't be wearing. No one could be wearing Rodney Rogers, right? Right. Yeah. If that's fifty-four, I know that one. Yeah. So no, it's interesting. Uh, I'll leave you on this. You mentioned Jamie Newman, and you know, in a way, what Jamie Newman did against NC State in the last quarter of that game is is kind of what uh, MJ Morris just did to Virginia Tech. Only difference is MJ wasn't throwing to a walk-on tight end. <laughs> he was on scholarship by that point. Jack Frudenthal oh, would, okay. yeah, Jack Frudenthal would uh, would legendary. like me to correct that if he if he heard uh, it. Legendary figure in in the NC State Wake Forest rivalry the last fifteen years. And his o- Ari his, Hines. Shout, his shout only catch. Ari Hines, if you're listening. That was uh, Jack Frudenthal's only catch of that game. And then in 19, when State came to Wake, I think he had four catches in the game and three touchdowns. You know, I would say, though, there's, there's always plays that people remember the rivalry between Wake and and, uh, and State. And, you know, one of the plays that immediately comes to mind is when Russell Wilson finally had his interception streak snapped against, um, which was at uh, in Winston-Salem. He had a lengthy, lengthy streak of not throwing interception but the one play that probably more people will remember about wake and nc state i would argue is when nate irving suplexed running back mike campanaro who became a very good wide receiver but in that game he was playing running back and when nate irving did the suplex on him and went all wwe i think that was one of the more memorable plays of the last 15 years period especially in the the nc state wake forest robbery Man, I never even knew Campanero played running back. He did in that game. Man. That was not a good Wake Forest team that year, or at least at that it, point in the season. It fell off so much at the end of the Grove tenure, and I, I covered some of those games when I was working for Burlington, and, man, it was it was not a good it was not a good end to a tenure. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely – I'm not saying, at, you know, what year and which coach, but there's been a few years where mostly in Raleigh – you know, Wake usually plays better at home, but there's been a couple of years where Wake Forest would come to Raleigh and you just knew, like, could they come within 25 points or, you know, can they can they even get to 10 points? I mean, there was some lean, lean offense at, at different times. But, 20, uh, 2016, Wake was a bowl team and went there, and I think it was like 17 nothing after 10 minutes. 
Yeah. So, well, where can people find your updates on Twitter this week? Uh, it'll be all over the place. Uh, I'll be at, at the at the personal account, I guess. Connor O'Neill, uh, one N, two L's, underscore D I. And then uh, the Wake Forest account is Wake Rivals. Um, no periods, no underscores, anything like that. Just just Wake Rivals, Deacons Illustrated. That's me. Cool. Well, I appreciate taking some time, and uh, we'll, we'll see which teams show up on Saturday. <laughs> Thanks, man. My pleasure.